Welcome to Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we continue with the tales of Troy with the story of the death of Palamedes. Now, Palamedes was the wisest man in the Argive army. All knew him to be tireless, just, steadfast, and thoughtful. He was of delicate build and versed in the art of singing and playing the lyre. It was his eloquence that had swayed the greater part of the princes of Greece in favor of the campaign against Troy, and his shrewdness that had discovered the ruse of the wily son of Laertes. But this had gained him an implacable foe, one who pondered revenge day and night, and who brooded the more sullenly, the more wise, Palamedes was honored by other princes. Now, an oracle of Apollo informed the Argives that in the place where his statue and his temple stood, they were to sacrifice Akatom to Apollo, Cementheus, the name he was known by in Troy, and that Palamedes had been chosen to take the victim to their destination. Chrysus, the prince of Apollo, was to receive the stately animals and make the offering. The worship of the sun god in this region was of curious origin. In earlier times, when King Teucer and his men had come from Crete and landed on this part of the coast of Asia Minor, an oracle commanded them to remain where their enemies would crawl out of the ground. Now, when they arrived in Hexetus, a city in that region, mice slipping out of holes in the earth came at night and gnawed at their shields. This they regarded as the fulfillment of the oracle, and therefore they settled in that vicinity and erected a statue to Apollo with a mouse at his feet. In the dialect of Aeolia, smithos is the word for mouse. So it was to Apollo, Simentheus, whose temple stood on a height not far from Chrysa, that Chryseus the priest offered the hundred sacred sheep brought there by Palamedes. The fact that Apollo himself had chosen Palamedes for this and thus accorded him special honor only hastened his destruction. For now Odysseus began to boil with envy and thought up a despicable plan to put an end to his rival. With his own hands he concealed a sum of money in the hut of the man he hated, going there in secrecy. Then in the name of Priam, he wrote a letter to Palamedes in which the king of Troy expressed thanks for his having betrayed the secrets of the Argive host. This letter was allowed to fall into the hands of a captive from Phrygia, in whose possession Odysseus discovered it, apparently by chance. Immediately he ordered the innocent bearer killed. Then the son of Laertes showed the letter in an assembly of Argive princes. The indignant leader summoned Palamedes to a council to which Agamemnon had appointed the foremost among the Achaeans and over which Odysseus had arranged to preside. At his suggestion, men were sent to dig in the accused man's hut, and of course, they found the gold Odysseus himself had buried under Palamed's couch. The judges, knowing nothing of the true state of affairs, unanimously condemned him to death. Palamed's did not deign to defend himself. He saw through the plot, but had no hope of proving either his own innocence or the guilt of his enemy. When he heard that he was to die by stoning, he only cried out, O oh, Argives, you are about to kill a nightingale, most innocent, most wise, and rich in moving song. But the dull princess only laughed at this singular form of defense and led Palamedes, the noblest among them, away to an unmerciful death, which he suffered with gentleness and courage. After the first stone had struck him down, he called, Rejoice, O truth, for you have died before me. When he said these words, a stone thrown by vengeful Odysseus struck his temple. His head drooped, and he died. But Nemesis, the patroness of justice, 
gaze down from the ramparts of heaven and resolved to punish the Achaeans and Odysseus, who had tricked them into this crime at the very goal of their desires. Achilles and Ajax Legend has little to tell about the next few years of the war against Troy. The Argives were not idle, but since the Trojans husbanded their strength and seldom attacked, they turned their attention to the region surrounding Troy. In the course of time, Achilles destroyed and looted twelve towns and his ships and conquered eleven on land. In a marauding expedition to Mycia, he carried off Chrysus, the lovely daughter of Chryseus, a priest of Apollo. When he invaded Lyrnesius, he took the palace of Briseis, the king and the priest of the city, who hanged himself with a rope. Briseis, his lovely daughter, who was called Hippodamia, fell into the hands of Achilles, and he took her with him as his favorite among his captives. The island of Lesbos and Thebe in Cilicia, a city founded at the foot of Mount Placus, were also forced to yield to him. The king of this city was Eshan, a son-in-law of Priam, since his daughter Andromache had wedded Hector, the greatest among the heroes of Troy. Seven sons in the flower of youth were still in their father's palace. But Achilles stormed the high gates and slew the king with all seven of them. When Eshan's body lay under its bier in forbidding majesty, young Achilles was shaken with dread, and he dared not strip the dead king of his arms and vaunt them as his spoils. He had the corpse burned, clad in the full glory of armor, artfully wrought of shining metals, and heaped for Eatian a mighty burial mound, which for many years adorned the region. It loomed high under the shadow of stately elms, but he carried off Eshan's wife as a slave. Later, he released her for a large ransom. She returned home, where an arrow launched by Artemis killed her as she sat weaving at the loom. Out of the king's stables, Achilles took Pedasus, his slender-ankled horse, which, though born and bred on earth, equaled his own immortal steeds in strength and speed, and vied with them in running at the chariot. And from the armory of King Aetian, he carried off splendid spoils, among them an iron discus so huge that it would have yielded enough metal to make all the field implements a peasant needed for five years. After Achilles, the tallest and bravest of the heroes was Ajax, son of Telamon. He too did not waste his time in idle waiting, but took his ships towards the Thracian Cursinesus, where Polynestor had his palace. To this king, Priam of Troy, had sent his youngest son, Polydorus, whom Laotho, a concubine, had borne him, for he wanted him reared in Thrace, safe from the war. He had not given gold and treasure to Polynestor to pay for the care and upbringing of the child. But when Ajax invaded his country and besieged his citadel, the faithless barbarian used both the funds and the boy entrusted to him to buy peace from the Argives. He betrayed King Priam, heaped him with imprecations, and divided the money and grain he had received for the nurture of Polydorsus among the Achaean fighters. To Ajax himself he gave the golden treasure of his ally, and finally the boy as well. Ajax did not immediately return to the Argive fleet with his spoils, but made for the coast of Phrygia. There he attacked the realm of Teutherus, slew the king, who met him at the head of the warriors, and took captive his daughter, queenly Tecmessa. Her great beauty and noble spirit commanded his esteem and won his love. He honored her as his wife, and would have married her had Argive customs permitted him to wed a barbarian. Returning from their successful maraudering expeditions, the son of Peleus and the son of Telamon arrived at the camp before Troy at the same time, the ships laden with spoils. 
the Danai went to the shore to meet them and broke into loud cheers. Heroes thronged round Ajax and Achilles, who stood in the midst of the gathering and received the prize of victory. The olive wreath sat on their heads with joyful acclaim. After the ceremony, a council was held for the distribution of the spoils, which were considered common property among the Achaeans. And now the captive women were shown, and all marveled at their beauty. Achilles was given the daughter of Briseis, and Ajax was confirmed in the possession of queenly Tecmessa. The son of Peleus was moreover permitted to keep Diomedia, the playmate of his beloved, who used to be parted from the friends she had grown up with in the house of Briseis. When she was brought before the hero, she threw herself at the feet of Achilles, imploring him with tears not to part her from her young mistress. Chrysus, the daughter of Croesus, the priest, was given to Agamemnon, the leader of the entire host, as a mark of honor to his kingship, and Achilles granted her willingly. The other spoils of war, captives, and provisions were divided equally among the warriors at the request of Odysseus and Diomedes. Ajax had the treasure of King Polynestor unloaded from his ships. Of this, also Agamemnon was awarded an ample share of silver and gold. And here ends my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.